to the Gospel of John, chapter number 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. But before we read these verses, I'll remind you that John's purpose in writing what he wrote as he was led of the Holy Spirit was that we might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That was his purpose. And he states that purpose in the 20th chapter. And really that's the theme verse of this, of this entire book. These things have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, here in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, we're going to see our Lord's first miracle. The first miracle that He ever performed. And He did so at the start of His ministry when He was approximately 30 years of age. There are some ancient writings out there that says that our Lord worked miracles as a child. And these writings were written probably 1,800 years ago, something like that. They were written well after the Bible was completed, and they were rejected as inspired writings. They were rejected by the early church fathers as being Scripture. So really, they bordered on, the, on, really, they bordered on blasphemy. Uh, they recorded that our Lord was uh, working miracles as a, as a young child and turning clay, I believe, into birds and uh, healing the father of a friend, on and on and on. But none of that is true. And the reason we know that is not true is because Scripture, Holy Scripture before us this morning is going to tell us that what we're reading was His first miracle. And that first miracle took place at a wedding. Now most all of you, if not 100% of you, except for maybe for the really wee ones, have all attended a wedding. It may have been your own. Uh, it definitely could have been friends and other family members, but you all are familiar with weddings, and it was at a wedding that our Lord worked His very first miracle. What is the point of that miracle? John said that we might believe that He is the Son of God. That was the point. And that was the point of all of the miracles that our Lord worked. Notice with me now in verse number 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee... And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and His disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto Him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what, I, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece, twenty to thirty gallons. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, he didn't know where it come from, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth His glory, and His disciples believed on Him." 
Let's pray again. Father, bless the reading of your word. Father, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Give us minds to receive what you would have us to have. Capture our attention. Lord, help us to focus. But we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. His first miracle. His first miracle took place at a wedding. I've been at many weddings as an attendant and as an officiant. I've always pleased that most weddings that I've been a part of, there ultimately is a miracle that takes place. And usually that miracle is where the bride and the mother of the bride finally get back in harmony together by the time the ceremony starts. (laughs) Because most of them I have seen, there has been a lot of friction leading up to it due to the stress and all of that. Other things that I have seen at weddings is generally there's always somebody late. Usually they're part of the wedding party. There's always, almost always, somebody late. But ultimately it always comes together at the last minute. It ends up being a beautiful thing. And uh, there's harmony and love, at least for a while. But here in verses 1 and 2, I want you to see the setting for this great miracle that our Lord is going to work. Notice it is at a marriage, it is at a wedding, and it's in a very small little place that you and I would call a little village. Just a very sparsely populated area called Cana. Cana was probably eight or nine miles away from Nazareth. Do you remember Jesus' hometown? Not where he was born, but his hometown, it was Nazareth. He is called Jesus of Nazareth in Scripture, although he was born in Bethlehem. So these are two communities that are very close together, extremely close together. Chances are the people that were in Nazareth knew most of the people in Cana. Chances are they were relatives, right? A lot of times in our small communities, everyone knows everyone, and a lot of times there are relations. You know one another. If you chase the line down far enough, you're going to find out that you're second cousins, third cousins, etc., etc. So that's the setting of this miracle. It takes place at a wedding. It takes place in a tiny little rural village called Cana. And we find in verse number 1 that the mother of Jesus was there. And it seems that she was more than just uh, maybe someone sitting in a chair witnessing everything. She was probably more than just someone who was sitting there and enjoying the fellowship of the festivities. It appears that she may have been serving. It appears that she may have been very close to the families that were being united in marriage, and she was there being a helper. And we know in our modern day weddings, a lot of times those that are closest to the bride or whatnot, whether it's through friendship or family, you're very active during the reception, you're very active leading up to the big day, and you're trying to help, and and there was Mary. She seems to be in that role. Because she is aware of something that probably most people that were attending was unaware of. The wine had run out. And that was about to be a social problem. Now if you've ever hosted some big gathering, some of you may have been a little nervous. Did we buy enough? Did we make enough? Did we cook enough? And you might get a little antsy or get a little nervous if you start to see... The supplies dwindle. Well, they didn't just dwindle, it ran out. Empty, gone. All right? But notice also that Mary was not the only guest that you and I are familiar with. But the Bible says in verse 2 that Jesus and his disciples were called to the marriage. They were on the invitation list. You are a wise husband and wife who invites Jesus to your wedding and to your home. I remember many, many years ago officiating at a wedding and I had a 
an elderly man come up to me after the service and he said, you did a good job, but I believe that was the most scripture I have ever heard read at a wedding. And I said, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you noticed. If I officiate a wedding, I want them to be spiritual. I really do. I want it to have a spiritual atmosphere. I want it to have... I want us to be looking to Jesus. And I don't think that's something you ought to start doing in the 10th year of your marriage or the 40th year of your marriage or when you have a disaster in your marriage. I think it ought to start from day one. And you would be a wise couple. If you didn't do it on the day of your marriage, you would be a wise couple if you'd start this day by inviting God into your home. And by doing that, that means you're going to have some family devotions. You're going to have some family prayer. You're going to make church attendance a priority. You're going to uh, desire to see the salvation of your loved ones, in particular your own children. That's going to be the evidence of inviting Christ into your most important relationship the relationship of a marriage, the relationship of a family. And Jesus and the disciples were called to this marriage. Now this marriage would be different from what you and I have. Now here today we might have a, a rehearsal on a Friday night, a ceremony on Saturday with a reception to follow, and then off they go, and generally the parents, especially of the bride, will go home exhausted wiped out, <laughs> tired beyond tired, and possibly the parents of the groom would be in somewhat of a similar condition. But in weddings in this day, they would last a week. A week. And then, after the wedding ceremony, bride and groom, right, we throw bird seed at them, and they go off and they leave us all here. Not in that day. You would go outside and you would get your torch and you would follow them home. All of us would follow them home. And I was thinking if we were to do something similar to that here, and generally you didn't take the shortest route. Shortest distance between two places is a straight line. Not on this night. You wanted to make it last. You wanted the community to get involved, so you would make some right turns and some left turns. You wanted the neighbors to come out and wave and wish you well, and you would take your time. And I thought if we were to do that here, instead of heading straight down the line, we might take a ride at the dirt road. And go around to the dirt road and hang a left. And then I thought, there's nobody there, so nobody would see us. We still messed up. <laughs> So we would might have to walk a long ways if we were to have a wedding from here if we wanted the community to see it by those who did not show up. But a marriage was a community event back in that day. It was a community event. It was a big deal. It lasted for a week, typically. Seven days. Festive and all of this. It was a big, big deal. Notice in verse number 3. 3 through 5. So we see the setting, let's, let's see the need that arises. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, she spoke to the Lord Jesus and said to him, they have no wine. It's empty. Meaning these families are about to be embarrassed. They're about to be embarrassed. You made a big guest list. You invited the community and now you can't even provide for all of those who have shown up. So Mary is being moved with compassion, right? None of us want our loved ones and our neighbors to be embarrassed. We don't want that to happen. We want to avoid deep shame and deep embarrassment. And she makes this need known to Jesus. Notice in verse 4. And Jesus said unto her, Jesus said unto his mother, Woman, let's stop right there. Don't you say that to your mama. <laughs> oh my, I thought about that. If I had called my mother woman, woo, it would have been bad. 
But understand, in 2024 or even 20 years ago in this country, the only way you and I can interpret this on the surface would be disrespectful. That's not what our Lord was. That's not what our Lord was doing. But if you were to call Mama, Mimi, Mama, woman, uh, that would be disrespectful. And you probably would be called on the carpet pretty quickly, I would think, if not by her, by dad, or by grandpa, or whatnot. That would be corrected. Our Lord never sinned. Our Lord was never disrespectful. Our Lord never embarrassed people purposely. Some people felt shame because he always spoke the truth. But he never set out to simply embarrass people, to hurt people, or to be in any way disrespectful. Verse 4, when he uses the word woman, and he does this more than once. As a matter of fact, he, he does this from the cross, right? He does this from the cross as he makes sure that his mother would be properly cared for as he was going to die on the cross and then be placed in a tomb three days. And then later he would be resurrected and then after 40 days he would ascend up. And he said, woman then. It would be along the lines of lady. It would be along the lines of lady or the long, along the lines of ma'am. But here's what's going on. He is communicating to her by saying woman instead of mother or mom, or some appropriate family title, he is saying our relationship has changed. There's no mention of Joseph in the Scriptures, Joseph the husband of Mary, after the initial birth of Christ in that short first short period of time where Joseph is to provide for the Christ child and to take them down into Egypt and to make sure that they're not harmed. After about, well, at age 12 he's still alive. When Christ is 12, Joseph is still alive. But then he disappears from Scripture. Why did he disappear from Scripture? It's pretty obvious. He had passed. He had passed away. Well, who was the oldest of the children of Mary? Obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born of a virgin. He was placed in the womb of Mary by an act of the Holy Ghost of God. And after she was born, the Bible says that Joseph knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. So that means that while they were married, they never had physical intimacy until after she had given birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then from that point, they went on to have children. At least four boys, at least two girls, and the boys are named in Scripture. But when Joseph passed, as in our day, especially several decades back, quite a few decades back, a lot of times when dad would pass, there would be some responsibility put on the shoulders of the firstborn, especially the firstborn son. I can remember a good friend, a good friend who's 25 or 30 years older than me, but many years ago when I was much younger and he was much younger, he shared with me about his dad passing away. And uh, he was still in high school at that time, and he had younger siblings that were considerably younger to, than him. And he said the weight of taking care of his mother and of his siblings fell on him. And I can remember my grandparents, uh, one of my grandfathers, saying something very similar, who was born in the 19-teens and uh, lived through the Great Depression and how things fell upon his shoulders. So we can kind of relate to that. So what I'm saying is, that when Mary approached Jesus about the wine being gone and the families are about to be embarrassed, she did what she probably had been doing for some time. She went to her oldest son for some help. Now some people say that she went to him requesting a miracle. Where does it say that? He had never worked a miracle before. So why in the world would she assume that he would all of a sudden work a miracle over the beverages running out? 
Now again, I understand embarrassment and shame, but let's be honest. That's not a life and death moment, right? That is not a life and death situation. So if he had never worked a miracle before, why would she anticipate him working one now? I don't think she did. I believe she just simply went to him, as she probably had done in the past, and said, we've got a problem, and was hoping maybe he had a solution. Now think about this with me for a moment. Jesus never gave bad advice. Never. Have you ever received bad advice? Or even worse, acted on the bad advice? I have. Have you ever given bad advice? I think I have done that as well. Lord Jesus never did. I believe any time Mary went to him after Joseph had passed and said, here's a problem, he had a solution. Not one that necessarily required miraculous intervention, but he had a good solution. He had perfect wisdom. He had perfect knowledge. And I think that's what's taking place here. Stay with me now. Stay with me. This is good stuff, I'm telling you. Good. I love God's Word. They have no wine. Jesus responds, Woman, what have I to do with thee? He's saying we've got to move beyond mother and son. We've got to move beyond mother and son. My public ministry has begun. I have come to do my father's will, Christ would say, not my mother's will. Matter of fact, he made that statement when he was 12 years old in the temple. You remember they were this large caravan, a mass of humanity on the move, and Mary and Joseph lost track of Jesus. That's happened to you where you've lost track of one of your children, maybe in a, uh, in a big box store in the mall, and you panic very briefly until you find them. Well, they were looking around and they couldn't find Jesus. And they could not find Jesus for an extended period of time. And when they finally found Him, He was astonishing people with His knowledge and authority by which He spoke about the things of God. And when they found Him, they basically said, paraphrasing, you gave us a great fright. And He said, I must be about my Father's business. He said that at age 12, and now this public ministry has begun, and he said, our relationship has changed. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Now watch this next phrase. Mine hour is not yet come. He's going to talk about his hour over and over again, and that's talking about his suffering. It's talking about his death. And then in verse 5, his mother said unto, him, unto the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. She does not give the Lord Jesus an order. She does not say to Jesus, this is what you ought to do. She just simply said, the wine is gone. She made no demands. That's important. There are religious groups today, and it always makes me shudder, it even makes me angry, who will say that if you want the son, God the son, to do anything, you need to talk to his mama. Go to Mary to get the Lord to do something. Folks, that's blasphemous. That is wrong. The disciples came to Christ and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. He didn't name any of the saints. Any of the ain'ts, he didn't name Mary. He said, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven. Now that does not literally mean we have to use that exact verbiage, but he was saying we direct our prayers to God. And Mary made no demands here. You might even see a, a rebuke, a minor rebuke here. So I want to get that crystal clear here in this passage. But she does give an order, a command to the servants, the people that are the servers. And she says, whatever he says do, you do it. I don't know what he's going to do, but whatever he says do, you just do it. Folks, that's good counsel. Mary was a wise woman. 
She was a wise woman. She was a godly woman. And we have wise, godly women in this place this morning, as we do men as well. But anybody who ever tells you simply do what the Lord says, understand they're showing to you, they're sharing with you a little bit of wisdom. Whatever He says do, do it. Verse number 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone. Imagine a very large water pot that can hold 20 to 30 gallons of water. This would not be small. This would be a big water pot. So each of these pots can hold 20 to 30 gallons of liquid, of water. And those stones were there for uh, purification purposes. The Jews were to wash their hands and wash the utensils ceremoniously and all those kinds of things. And there was the water pots. And Jesus told them in verse 7, I want you to fill these water pots with water. And it says that they filled them all the way up to the brim. You couldn't get another cup of anything in those pots. They were full. And He said to them, draw out now and bear to the governor. Think about maybe the head waiter the head server. Draw it out now and take it to the, the head server of this feast. And they did it. They bear it in verse number 8. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, so water was put in and then it was dipped up and when it was handed to him, it was wine. This miracle is a miracle that demonstrates our Lord as Creator. He made something out of nothing. The pots were not half full so that wine could be added in, which was common. They would dilute wine back in that day to avoid uh, intoxication. It would be heavily diluted. The water was very unhealthy to drink. Some of you that have been to foreign countries, a lot of times what some people who are veteran travelers will tell you, or maybe even the locals will tell you, don't drink the water. And when... I went to Mexico with some friends on a mission trip many years ago. When we arrived, our missionary residents, our missionary host said, don't drink the water. So we're talking 2,000 years ago. Water was regularly unsafe, so they would drink diluted wine for safety's sake. But this water pot here was not half full, it was full to the brim. Nothing at all could be added to it. And the Lord turned it into wine. Now watch this. There's the miracle. The water was turned into wine at a wedding. Notice now the response in verses 9 through 11. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, he didn't know where it come from, he had no idea. He thought it was already had always been in store, but the servants, <clears throat> but the servants which drew the water, they knew. And the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine unto, ne unto now. Now think about this. This head server, this, this maybe we could call him a caterer. He was a man that has some experience in feeding the masses, right? Uh, I'm amazed that people can do that. I'd be sweating bullets if I had to show up at a wedding and be responsible to feed 100 or 200 people. That wouldn't be me. I always pity the photographers. I always think, what if they mess up? You can't redo, right? I guess that's why they bring multiple cameras uh, but I can't imagine doing those kinds of things and having that pressure and then realize, oh no, I missed every picture, nothing worked. But here's a veteran server, a veteran caterer of some sort, and he says this to the bridegroom. He's tasted it and he says, mercy, this is the best I've ever tasted. It's better than anything we have served yet. And he calls this fellow up and says, you know, you've done something that's different. Usually you bring out the worst first, or, or bring out the best first, 
And then when people have well eaten, the stomachs are full, and they've had all the beverage they desire, then they bring out the worst. But he said, you've saved the best for last. And I thought about that. Listen to me. That's the way of the world to bring out the best first. That's the way of the world. The way of the world will tell us might show us, pursue that relationship, pursue that party. Oh, that'll make you popular, that'll make you influential, that'll win you friends. Oh, that will just be everything bright and shiny. The world shows you the best first. Are y'all listening up there in the balcony? The world will show you the best first, but they don't show you what's to come after that's often inferior and even ugly. Years ago, I had a, went to ER, emergency room, to see someone very dear to me, all gashed up in the face, bloody mess, bloody mess. They got there as a result of an accident, but more so because of stupidity and poor choices. They were there because of a DUI driving under the influence, and, and, and this individual was the driver. But earlier in the night, that person was the life of the party. Earlier in the night, they were having fun like you would not believe. And the world shows you being popular, the life of the party, and having fun, but then later on, the world shows you the inferior. Or usually, you don't see it till you experience it. And this person had a totaled vehicle. And this person had to have a multitude of stitches prominent that still remains there to this day of a decision that was made very foolishly many years ago. And you can reapply this over and over and over again where you are shown the bright and the shiny, the attractive, and then later on things fall apart and get very inferior. Well, here's what our Lord does. Well, our Lord... It just seems to get better and sweeter. When I got saved, that was a glorious day in my life. But I knew a thimble full of Scripture. I probably could not have found the book of Genesis or the book of Revelation in the Bible on the day I got saved. I had no Sunday school background. I had no Bible background. But I had learned in in the course of a few weeks of church attendance that there was a hell and there was a heaven and that the only way to go to heaven was through Christ. I had learned that. I had heard that. And I wanted Christ as my Savior. I wanted eternal life. I did not want a devil's hell. I knew that much. But here's what's happened over time. It's gotten better and better. I now know more about the Word of God and the love of God. I have now seen uh, others come to know Christ, and I've been able to play a part in helping them find Christ. I've been able to experience a marriage with a godly woman and to have a home where Christ has been invited and to see my adult children have homes where Christ has been invited. And to watch my children pray with their children, my grandchildren. To watch them read the Bible and sing and have devotions with my grandchildren. I'm going to tell you something. Life's getting sweeter for me. I'm getting older and fatter and uglier. But it's getting sweeter. It's getting sweeter. I thought about if I could roll back the clock, and we know we can't. But if we could roll back the clock, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yes, I'd like to have a smaller waist and be able to bend over without hurting. But I would not replace where I am now with where I once was just to be able to grab a hold of youth again because of the walk, the journey that I've been able to enjoy with the Lord, the journey that I've been able to enjoy with a Christian godly woman and to see my children grown men and women today. Uh, trying to love their kids to Jesus. Last verse. Hang with me now. 
Verse number 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. And He manifested forth His glory. And watch this. And His disciples believed on Him. There were five of them there, we think. We think there were five of them there. Based upon the first few verses here of of Scripture, chapter 1. They believed on Him then. But oh, after they have seen this miracle, their faith is even deeper. Their belief's even stronger. And that's why I say I wouldn't go back. When I got saved, I was excited and I went home and got excited to tell my lost family about my salvation experience. I was puzzled when they didn't have the reaction that I was having. I I didn't understand that. But, but, my faith is deeper now. Things that would have absolutely knocked me for a loop way back then, I think I can better trust God now than I could then. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for all these that are gathered here. I ask God that if there are any yet not yet in the family of faith, that they would receive Christ as their Lord and Savior by simply confessing and admitting that they're a sinner in need of salvation and asking Him for forgiveness and for the salvation of their soul. Lord, we realize that salvation is not of good works. Salvation is not of good morality. It is not of good last name or decency. Salvation is a gift of God, bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus. I pray that all of these men and women, boys and girls, would come to know the Lord as their Savior. Thank you, Lord, for all the miracles we're going to be seeing in Scripture over the next several weeks. And Lord, I pray that these miracles would do for us as they did for the disciples, that they would deepen our faith. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.